first question. What is the deal with your dad? <laughs> My dad is definitely, you know, different. Ah! I'm damn near a superhero. All I need is a cake. <laughs> Can we go to the next question? Welcome to SI Now Live. That was a look at the trailer for the new Facebook show, Ball in the Family. I suppose the natural question, Ryan Aselta here with Robin Lundberg, is are you ready to ball? I, I think I am ready. After watching the entire trailer, which was about, what, two minutes long, Robin, I liked what I saw. And, and if I could get less LeVar Ball and more of the kids talking like they did in the trailer, the side story, the backstory to their mom, Tina, and her, her battle with a stroke and coming back from that. Some very, very interesting things. You saw the girlfriend right there of Lonzo Ball. Interesting character into yeah. the show. A lot of uh, <laughs> characters. This makes for a good sitcom, even, a re even if it is a reality show, right? And credit where it's due to LeVar Ball. You can say what you want about the guy, but he got Lonzo where he wanted him to be. He got the baller brand, or I'm sorry, big baller mm -hmm. brand off the ground. Now he's got this Facebook show platform. I mean, the guy has been, in, in a sense, a, a leader and uh, initiator uh, of his brand. I just have a feeling I'm going to be hitting the volume button down every time LeVar has something to say. You want to know those normalized <laughs> functions you'll, yes, you'll need with LeVar Ball. Please, yeah. Isaiah Thomas <laughs> says he'll be ready to ball for the Cavaliers next season. According to him, he said he's not damaged and will be the same player. Of course, his status could have some impact on the Cavs record. And yesterday, the NBA over-unders were released. To go through some notable teams and make our picks, we're joined by showrunner and inveterate gambler, Ben Teitelbaum. I inveterate gambler. Yes. I, 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 One way to I put got, it. I got my research. <laughs> came out yesterday, and I'm already ready to go. Just got to put a little aside to make sure I can, you know, move a little bit the natural start given the Isaiah Thomas news is with the Cavs and the Celtics in that trade so where would your money be on the over-unders there well my money's going hard on the Cavs over last year they won 51 games had a huge lull the second half of the season but there are a few things this year working in their favor one there's a LeBron James revenge here Kyrie's gone he wanted out LeBron I think wins the MVP and pushes his team to the number one spot in the Eastern Conference, and then they're deeper. They got Jay Crowder, Isaiah Thomas, Derrick Rose. Yeah, terrible as a starting point guard, more than sufficient as a little lightning rod off the bench. And I think it just will be easier for them to withstand the full season. What about Boston? Boston coming in at 56 and a half, 53 wins a year ago. Where do you go in that direction? How many teams last year won over 57 games? Three. Two. Two. Wow. The Spurs and the Warriors. Is Boston that good, yeah. especially with their depleted roster? Yeah, they got firepower for the playoffs with Gordon Hayward, Kyrie Irving. But can they sustain with so many of their pieces last year gone? They may need to figure it out along the way as good as Brad Stevens is. So I don't know. I could see them doing it, but I'm definitely not betting on I it. I think that's definitely an under. I mean, you look at last year. They had a really good year. I think their point differential was like plus 2.7. So their record may have been a little bit better than they actually were. They're going to lose Bradley. They're going to lose Crowder. They're set up better for the future, no doubt. But for this season, I would definitely go under. Now, the Golden State Warriors, what about them? What are they, 67 and a half? It's crazy, right? The new NBA where a 67 and a half over under is not surprising. So last year... They were 67 and 15. KD missed 20 games, and they're better this year. In six of the last 10 years in the NBA, the best team in the league won at least 66 games. Are you guys saying that the Warriors aren't two games better than the best team from yeah. those years? I think they are. And take into account another year with Durant, the chemistry factor of them playing together. Well, how much do you put on that? How many wins is that worth alone, guys? I think, uh, you know, it's, it's worth a couple, probably, and then they got a little deeper. And if you had asked me at any point in my life before this Warriors team came together, you'd give me a 67 and a half over under. I'd say, you have to take the under, but not with the Warriors. They're not a fair team. They really don't have a fair team. <laughs> and they could theoretically rest one of their big four literally every game throughout the season, and they'd still be favored in what? 79 games? Well, they won. I mean, they were on pace to be the best team in the league, I believe, over the time frame that Kevin Durant missed last year. So they won 73 games without Kevin Durant, and then they added Kevin Durant, but and then they've added You Monty. mentioned the rest. That's the thing that'll drive gamblers crazy. If you're sitting there and you have the over on the 67 and a half, and they're at 62, <laughs> and Durant's out one night, Curry another night, Thompson, 
you're pulling the little hair that you have left <laughs> in your hair like me right out. All right, how about rapid fire? Let's go through a bunch of teams here, see what you think over under. Let's start with the Lakers, 33 and a half. There's a problem for me, hard head. Laker fan from L.A., and I'm on the fence on this one. This is when I think if you're a gambler, you stay away because you just have no idea. Is Lonzo incandescent? Maybe down the road, but right away, not sure. They added a couple of pieces. Brooke Lopez, great stats guy, terrible team guy. Is this a better situation? Who knows? So, yeah, the team will be better than last year when they won 26 games, but do they make a seven-win jump in an always-loaded Western Conference? I don't think you can bet on it. That's one of those numbers that looks to me it's set right at the exact right place, which means, yeah, th don't touch it. How about uh, the, the Timberwolves at 48 and a half? I, I know you have strong feelings about this, Rob, and we were talking about it earlier. So I was doing some research. We need to fire up that SI stats and research team to get a little more in depth on this. It would be a 19 win jump for Minnesota to go from 31 wins last year uh, to over this year. 11 teams in NBA history have jumped at least 26 games. And judging on the roster makeover and with the comfort in Thibodeau's system one year in, the development of Carl Anthony Towns, obviously we know about Jimmy Butler. We know about uh, some role players like Jeff Teague and Taj Gibson. I could see it. Again, I think it's a stay away. I go hard under on the T-Wolves. The yeah. To me, this is like the, the McGregor-Mayweather fight where all the money's on McGregor because the, the fans are feeling a certain way and that shifts the line. I feel like the T-Wolves are a bit of a darling team between Thibodeau and the Butler acquisition because I could see them making a huge jump and winning 45 games. That puts them on. Right. I mean, they play a Western Conference schedule. That's a lot of losses that they face in the regular season. How about the Knicks? You got the drama with Carmelo. You got Kristaps Porzingis now. Supposedly the feud was with Jeff Hornacek is why he missed his exit meeting. 30 and a half. Last year was 31. Right there on the always number Always under with the Knicks, right? I mean, it's always got to be under. <laughs> I, think, I think Vegas is going to win a lot of money on the Knicks because I think the knee-jerk reaction is the Knicks. They're terrible. They're a train wreck. Of course they're going under. But – I think it might be a little bit different this year. They won 31 games last year. Are they going to be worse this time around? I think even if they lose Carmelo, they have Porzingis one year more developed. Tim Hardaway, whether or not you agree with the contract, I don't. I kind of like that signing, actually. I was on an island for he, that one. He is better than the guys they had playing swingman last year. And if Frank can be a plus at point guard, if he's an average defender and at least tries to get his – other teammates involved a little bit. He's an upgrade over Derrick Rose as a starter. So all they have to do is maintain the pace of last year, which wasn't great, and they're over. Starting point guard, a huge question for them, not for the Houston Rockets, though. Well, maybe who is going to get the, the bulk of the touches between James Harden and Chris Paul over under 55 and a half for the Rockets? I think this is easy. I don't understand this at all. Last year they won 55 games. How do they not get one game better with Chris Paul and essentially the exact same team? Look at Mike D'Antoni's history. Exclude the Lakers. Exclude the Knicks. Those teams weren't built for him. This team is. His teams won, once he had the Phoenix team in place, 62 games, 54 games, 61, 55, and last year, 55 games. I think this is as good, if not better, as any of those teams. I think they challenge for 60 wins. I think the question is fit it's here, right? Wrong. Because it's not enough of a jump, as you would think, given that they added Chris Paul. Yeah, and you talk about additions. How about the Thunder? Paul George. Russell Westbrook together. We'll see how that meshes right now. Vegas says 51 and a half. Last year, 47 with no Paul George there, Ben. Again, I think it's easy. How do they not jump five games? Someone play devil's advocate for me. I think this, this one, is over easy. I'm yeah. putting money on it. I'm going hard on it. Uh, Westbrook might calm down a little bit from his frenetic pace last year. Obviously, the triple-double was insane, and I think he proved the point he wanted to prove. So maybe now he can settle into... Go with the flow, Russ, a little bit more than always dominate every aspect of the game, Russ. And I think that leads to more wins. And Paul George is not quite Kevin Durant. He's as close to a replacement as you can get, and he doesn't quite need the ball as much either. I think he's a really good fit there. All right, now it's time for our locks. You won some money last year on the Nets under, big on the Celtics over. Now, this is very important, guys, because you roll back the tape next May on our locks, who we yeah. really want to put the we, money on. We can on. see if he backs up his <laughs> claims. Yeah, here. we got it on tape now, and uh, we will go to it if we need it. Let's I'm go to the spring. tape. All right, Ben, team or teams you are definitely putting your money on. Well, let me give you two, one under, one over. And let's start with the Atlanta Hawks. I got them over, uh, excuse me, I got them under 25 and a half, hard, easy, lock it in. 
Do you want me to start with the guys they lost or the guys they have? I know they're connected. Who is on the Hawks is a pretty good well, trivia well, question. Let's, let's just mention they lost Paul Millsap, Dwight Howard, Tim Hardaway, Kyle Korver, Tabo Sepalosha. That's 61% of their scoring. And the guys that need to pick it up are guys like Mike Muscala, Marco Bellinelli, a bunch of people who should not be starting, maybe should be eighth or ninth guys in the league. Here's a little stat for you. The last time that the worst team in the league won more than 20 games all the way back in 2006-2007 with the Grizzlies, and they only won 22. I think the Hawks will challenge the Bulls for worst team in the league by far, and even if they're just challenging them, it should be way under 26. That organ's going to be the only thing you hear in the arena this year for yeah. the Hawks. Okay. <laughs> and number two, we don't need to talk long about this, Spurs over 45, uh, 45 games is what it would need to put it over. The over-under is 44 uh, fi excuse me. It's got to be 54, yeah, right? 54. Yeah, I was yeah. like, 54 uh, uh, and a half. I'm leaving to put a bet on the Spurs <laughs> right now if it's 44. Don't be <laughs> guys. 44. 54 and a half. Yes, for, 54 for and a half. Company. The Spurs haven't won less than 55 games since 2009, 2010. There was a lockout year in there. They won 50 games, only lost 16. They were on pace. That means Kawhi Leonard, he's never hit the under. For the past five years, they've won more than 58. And Greg Popovich, since he got there in 96, only three times has he been under that mark of 54 and a half wins. I think 54 and a half for the Spurs, yeah. too easy, and people don't give them respect because they're boring. But, hey, if you're gambling, the money's interesting enough. The All right, how about some pressure now? Robin, give us your one. Where is the Lumberg money going? You know what? I, I could give you three. We already <laughs> did the Thunder and the T-Wolves. Right, I like yeah. the over for the Thunder, the under for the T-Wolves. I'll take the under for the Sixers as well. Similar to what happened with Minnesota where – I think they're sort of a darling team for good reason. People like the whole process. People like Embiid. But the jump to get to 42 and a half is so much from where they've been the last several seasons. I don't think they quite make it. All right. I'm putting the pressure on myself here. I'm going with the New Orleans Pelicans Woo! over Ooh. 39 and a half. The reason being, you get a full year of DeMarcus Cousins and Anthony Davis. Remember, Cousins joined them late February last year. A lot of talk. They've been working out together this summer talking about chemistry, those two at full strength are going to be very, very tough to stop in the front court. Here's a stat for you because Ben brought a lot to the table. Last nine games of the season, the Pelicans were 10.5 plus or minus net rating when those two were on the court together. That's a hot the only stat. team higher, the Golden State Warriors at 11 plus. So them together, full strength, a year under their belt, they can't get to 40 wins? The 500 team. I think we hit the over on analysis here. I yeah, think, yeah, we, yeah, we, we did it. <laughs> hey, if you're betting over on Boogie, God bless you. That, yeah, that's all I'm, I'm, I'm in say. on Boogie. I am over on Boogie. Word. I, I go with Ben there. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Now, these won't be available to bet on in Vegas, but Kobe Bryant did issue some challenges to players around the league. Let's go with th through a few and see if we think the challenge can meet the Mamba mentality. Here's what Kobe tweeted to the aforementioned Isaiah Thomas. I challenge you to make the all-NBA first team next season. Ryan, can he do that? No chance. No. He was second team last year. But look at your first team. LeBron, Harden, Westbrook, Kawhi Leonard, Anthony Davis. Where does Isaiah Thomas fit on in that group? Well, you know, I think he can really fill the role for the Cavs of the secondary scorer, yeah. secondary creator. But we don't even know if he's going to start the season. If he's not going to start the season, then he can't be first team all-NBA. Maybe third team all-NBA is realistic. Yeah. A Wizards fan page asked the Black Mamba if he had a challenge for John Wall. Kobe tweeted back saying, first team all defense. To me, he can do that. He has the physical makeup to answer that challenge. Yeah, it seems like Kobe's shooting for the stars here with some of these uh, tweets and calling guys out. Can he do it? Yes, but a lot of defense is wanting to do it. John Wall wasn't first or second team all defense last year. He was honorable mention, got a few votes. you got to want to play D all season long. I don't know if John Wall's that guy. And it was the fan page, too. It wasn't even yeah. Wall himself. <laughs> Finally, the Greek freak Giannis Antetokounmpo requested a challenge of his own. Kobe responded by simply saying MVP. What do you have on that Shoot one? Shoot for the moon. Yeah, I'm sorry. I love Giannis, but hey, Durant, Curry, LeBron, Harden, Westbrook, get in line. You ain't getting the MVP over any of those. Fights. I'd have him top three. I, I think LeBron Above is, go who, though? I think those LeBron guys. is going to win the MVP this year uh -huh. because Kyrie's gone, so the narrative fits him. If Cleveland finishes at the top of the Eastern Conference, he's going to get it. Kawhi Leonard, you know, we, we just talked to, to Ben about how the Spurs are always good. He hasn't gotten his MVP yet. 
Then I'd put Giannis, because all those other guys you mentioned are cannibalizing the votes from one another. Durant and Curry on the same team. Even Westbrook now has Paul George on his team. So the guys who are sort of by themselves, and that's how voters tend to go, are LeBron, Giannis, and Kawhi. I like, hey, set the goals high, see if you can get them, right? Well, in Major League Baseball last night, Chris Sale quickly quieted his critics with a dominating win on the mound. The Boston lefty earns our adrenaline performance presented by Toyota. Let's go places. The Sale, seven scoreless innings against the Blue Jays, allowing just three hits. Struck out 11 for his 15th win of the year. 11 Ks, Robin, with Sale's league-leading 17th double-digit strikeout performance of the season. Now, we're closing in on the baseball postseason here. Just over a month away, we are going to have a lot of the game's top pitchers on the playoff stage. Let's look at some of these guys. If you had one to put on the mound, a game seven, you need a win. Who's the guy you're sending to the mound? You just did the work for me. <laughs> I mean, it's Chris Sale. 1,500 strikeouts? What is he, pitched 1,300 innings? He does it in the American League against the DH. I'm going with the guy who's hot at the moment, who's been dominant this season. Give me Chris Sale. One thing on Sale, he's never pitched a postseason baseball game. So experience, we'll see how it comes so into play. Got? I'm going against the experience. I'm going with Clayton Kershaw. But he, we've seen him in the postseason. The postseason. Yeah. <laughs> I know it. But I think this is the year. He's 15-2, and two, and he's getting ready to come back after a month off. I think the month off, and not only the month off that he's had with the back injury, but the lead that the Dodgers have, they can kind of take it easy this last month of the season here. So it's essentially two months of cruising into the playoffs where you're going to get Kershaw at full strength. I know he's got an ERA over four career-wise in the postseason, but he had two gems last postseason against Washington and Chicago. I'm going with the lefty Kershaw. No doubt he comes back this week, Robin, off the DL. It's starting against the Padres on Friday night. All right, the first full week of college football on the calendar kicks off tomorrow night. To get you ready for the college season, SI.com has a list of 10 bold predictions up on the website this morning. Here now to give us a few even bolder predictions is SI.com's Pete Mundo. And Pete, let's start with 16th rank Louisville, who squares off this weekend Saturday against Purdue. You got a bold prediction surrounding the Cardinals? Lamar Jackson, guys, will be nowhere to be found in New York City for the Heisman Trophy uh, ceremony in December. So I just think this is a guy who cruised to that trophy last year, got off to a hot start. There was no real contender for it. So it was kind of like, well, we have to give it to Lamar Jackson. But this year, you have so many other people at the top of that list, different quarterbacks. And Lamar Jackson now has a full year of tape on him. So it just feels like the kind of year where Louisville is still going to be solid, but he is not going to be invited to that trophy ceremony in December. Not even invited. So if it's not Lamar Jackson, obviously, who's taking the Heisman Trophy? Well, the uh, Heisman Trophy winner is going to come from the state of Oklahoma. I don't know which guy, mm -hmm. but Baker Mayfield of the Sooners or Mason Rudolph, both quarterbacks in that state, one of those guys is going to win it. It sets up perfectly. High-powered offenses. One of them is going to win the Big 12 Conference. They play each other in early November. You could see a rematch in the Big 12 Championship game this year. But it just sets up too well with two loaded offenses in the same state. They'll both be in the top 10, top 15, primetime matchups all season long. It feels like the year where one of those two quarterbacks from that state is going to take home the trophy. Feels like a guy who likes the Big 12. Robin, yeah? <laughs> maybe, maybe sort of, a little bit. Pete, what about the playoffs? Seems like an eternity from now, but when it comes to January, what's your bold prediction? A two-loss team will make the playoff for the first time ever. I believe that's going to be Florida State. Uh, it feels like, first off, they're playing Alabama in the opener. They're going to lose that game, I believe. But I don't think that hurts them at all because Alabama is the consensus number one pick. Assuming that it'll get blown out by 30 points, they're okay. They're still in contention. The ACC winner is going to get in. The ACC is the deepest conference in the country. There's no doubt about that. They can still slip up against, you know, a Miami, um, a Florida at the end of the season. Any of those teams, they could have two losses, still get to that ACC title game, beat whoever comes out of the other side of the division, 
and then get themselves to the playoff because there's no way that they leave out a team that wins the ACC and has a couple of top 10 or top 15 losses on their resume. There's no way that happens. What about a surprise team that everybody's hot on but will miss the playoffs? Who you got? <sighs> South Florida, they got off to a rocky start last week. They were down 16-0 to San Jose State. They come back, they win the game. USF is favored in every game they play this year. Now, the problem is for a group of five school, they don't have that Houston-Oklahoma matchup like last year where you can get that big power five win and really get into the discussion if you're undefeated. They don't have that game. So even though they're going to roll through their schedule, I think 13-0 and under Charlie Strong, there's no way they're going to come anywhere near the college football playoff. All right, that's four. Of course, we roll in uh, fives here on SI now. That's right. We want a bolder than bold prediction, Pete to get us into the first full weekend here. A major Power 5 coach will be out of a job by Halloween. And the two names I see on that list, Kevin Sumlin or Brian Kelly. Texas A&M or Notre Dame. You look at their schedules, uh, Alabama and Florida back-to-back -back weeks for Kevin Sumlin in October. And then you have a bye week. If he struggles the first six, seven games, that's a perfect time to let a guy go, figure out what you're doing, and move on. On top of that, Brian Kelly plays USC and NC State, very underrated NC State team, back-to-back -back weeks in late October. Once again, you struggle there. You also have Georgia in week two. All of a sudden, Brian Kelly could be on the hot seat and, and on his way out very quickly. The other factor here in all this is the fact that there's an early signing period now in December. So if you're going to get rid of a coach, you want to do it even earlier. And you're seeing these midseason firings, less miles last year. But now with the early signing period, Recruits want to know earlier than ever who's going to be the head coach. So if you're sitting there in October and Brian Kelly and Kevin Sumlin just aren't getting it done, it's not working, let them go, pay the 10 $15 million, which all these schools now have because there's so much cash in the sport, and move on and try to find who's next. So one of those two guys, I believe, done by Halloween. There you have it. Not just bold. But bolder predictions. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. Appreciate it. No problem, it. guys. Cyrus Mary is best known for helping establish the Rooney Rule in the NFL. Yesterday, the longtime civil rights lawyer stopped by to talk with Maggie Gray about where he thinks the NFL PA executive director, D. Smith, has gone wrong and when he'd want to start renegotiations with the NFL on a new CBA. Cyrus Mary, civil rights attorney, you would like to be the next executive director of the NFL Players Union. Now, there's a little wrinkle here because the players and the union board may have a referendum in mid-October where they could vote to extend D. Smith, the current NFLPA executive director, without allowing anyone to run against him. That doesn't leave you with a lot of time, and we know how popular incumbents can be and what an advantage they have. What's your strategy to try to get to players and the union board in this short amount of time? Sure. Well, first of all, I very humbly have come forward as a candidate. A lot of the Pro Football Hall of Famers and legends came to me because they saw a train wreck coming and because they could see that the PA and the league do not get along. They're not working constructively. They see that pretty much everything the incumbent has done has backfired. Traditionally, for the, throughout the entire history of the union, in March every three years, They've had an election, but in, what we are uncovering is that in October last year, while the NFL players were in the midst of their games, they somehow, without explaining the import of it, got people to sign off on a major change to the Constitution having to do with the election of the executive director. That Constitution's not publicly available. Virtually no one knows about it. And just this week, the last couple of days, that's now been exposed. What's the biggest misstep you think D. Smith has made as executive director? Strategic blunders in the 2011 negotiation. So the prior executive director, Gene Upshaw, under his tenure, actually the players got a bigger share of the pie. They got a 52 percent. Under D., they got dropped down to 47 percent, which is hundreds of millions of dollars per year, billions of dollars during the contract. And then he cried uncle by agreeing to a 10-year deal. No one in sports has a 10-year deal. No one in any other industry has a 10-year deal. Now, he'll say, oh, well, salary cap has gone up a little bit the last couple of years. But let's get to the facts. The fact is, is in 2012, the salary cap plummeted, and he had to get bailed out by the league to cover up his bad deal that he did. But then, right now, as the salary cap is going up, 
owner revenues are outpacing their player revenues still right now as we speak. Well, devil's advocate or maybe D side would say, well, they won in other parts of the negotiation. They were able to reduce practice time. They were able to get other things that in theory, the constituency really did want. What would you say to that? Well, I think there are that, there are some good things that came out of that. And I understand the players had good ideas that got into the 2011 deal. I also understand that D was not a very effective negotiator, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that the players overall got a major setback in that deal. And they also, I think their dignity got squashed because they gave the full power without any checks and balances to the commissioner on discipline. Well, that's one thing I want to bring up because it does get uh, in the news so often because right. even though it is a very small amount of players who have to come under these disciplinary rules, it gets a lot of headlines. Obviously, if you were the new NFLPA executive director, how high on your priority list would be reforming the player discipline? Well, one thing for sure I'm going to try, focus on is day one is going to start to renegotiate the, this, this horrible CBA that the, owner, the players are in right now. This is a system that doesn't have a lot of credibility, and we can improve it for the good of the game. So the owners are going to need to change it as, as much as the players, but right now, under D, they're locked into this. Yeah. How can you start making changes if the CBA is not up to the year 2021? How can you start that on day one if you got elected? Well, first of all, no one thought when Johnny Cochran and I challenged the NFL what led, led to the Rooney Rule. I had all these people tell me, Cyrus, you can't get them to change. Guess what? We got fundamental, massive change that has been good for the game. And so with that, I have the kind of relationship with the league where they trust me and I've earned their respect. And they know, they themselves have indicated, according to the Washington Post, that they're ready to start talking about the CBA Meanwhile, my opponent sat here on this show and said, oh, four years from now, we're going to have a work stop. Yeah, he talked to my colleague Albert Breer about right. that. I, I think, though, I mean, what can you do? The deal doesn't expire in, for several more years, and it does not behoove the owners by any stretch or the league to come to the table before then, does it? Well, there are benefits for both sides to get, to get started on it. And the thing is, is that if the Washington Post is correct, the league is ready to start talking, and yet the union head is talking about a work stoppage. Never in the history of the U.S. labor movement, which is over 100 years old, has a labor leader said, four years from now, my workers are going to have a work stoppage is virtually certain. And now we know because of this secret constitutional change that the whole thing that he told, he told Albert was just an election ploy. It has nothing to do with the merits of, of or a anything. negotiation ploy, right? I mean, is is it is it an election ploy, or could it also could he argue that it would be a negotiation ploy to try to also strike fear into the heart of his opponent, being the league, that if they don't, you know, come to the table with an open mind, that the players may strike. Well, the timing is very suspicious. Okay, he's here on your show here uh, with your colleague in August, and he and he doesn't, and he gives the whole world the false impression that his election is in March. And then it turns out there is no election. They come up with some kind of kind of Soviet style, non-democratic process that to try to rubber stamp him. And the first step in that process, which people don't know about, is that he gives himself a report card. And that's the basis for making a decision. Well, he's not in position to give himself an accurate report card. Kevin Durant is stepping into the cupcake moniker given to him by OKC fans. Literally. KD's newest colorway version of his signature shoe is red velvet and was unveiled in a photo surrounded by red velvet cupcakes. Ryan, you copping those kicks? You know, I may be, Robin. I think this is clever. I love that Durant and Nike, they're, they're laughing about this. What better way to move on than just to laugh at yourself? This is fun. And if you read the press release on how they describe these, they use the word sweet and and velvety silky smooth game of kevin durant the first the decadent shoes decadent of the icing on the cupcake and you know what aesthetically they look pretty sweet yeah they're kind I of mean, they're kind of fresh. no that, pun intended did you do that, that on was purpose? an accident i swear to you that was uh, an accident that was the icing <laughs> on the cake for this show we're done here for si now live of course <laughs> make sure you follow us on twitter at si now live and we will be back tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. Eastern.
I got the, the uh, old what school Air Force Ones on right now. That wasn't a good angle. It was, it was pretty sweet. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like the icon.